Happy New Year. This is a time where we are hopeful. I hope you're hopeful. And if you're not hopeful today, we're going to a, a, go on a journey on how to live backwards. Before we jump into this message, I just want to share with you that, that this, this new year, every year when we come to a new year, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of anticipation and excitement about all the goals that I'm going to achieve. How many of you achieve, uh, overachievers out there have written out your goals and you have your mood board and you have your vision board and you have, or how many of you just have dreams in your head of what you want to look like this year? Come on, like 20 pounds. Uh, tw okay, let's not go there, but we're motivated. I hope you have natural anticipation. You're motivated just to change. You want to go after your goals, shred those pounds. Stop eating the baker's dozen and just pull it back to 12 donuts. You know what I mean? Really cut calories. Uh, stop the bad habit. Go after a degree or a certificate. I want to buy an online certificate that says, I am right, babe. I'm right. Oh, I'm Mr. Right for you, and I'm right all the time. All right? I just... No, we want to, how many of you have some spiritual goals? You want to read the Bible more. You want to know what God's saying to you. You want to, you want to get direction for your life. And then I want to pray more and hear from him more. And so part of that is you're here and you're already doing that. 52 amazing steps to get there means you're in one of those steps right now at church for the Lord prayerfully. But I've learned there's something most of us usually don't bring into the new year. In fact, we avoid it at all costs sometimes, and that's a, a good old dose of perspective and reality. Uh, there's nothing magical about a brand new year. No superpowers given to you. Uh, no Jedi mind tricks to alter or control other people around you and the cir circumstances that are around you. Uh, you we might even resist... Um, change. We might even resist this reality and this truth and we cover our, our ears and we bury our heads and we will tend to be delusional and kind of avoid truth at the sake of living in fantasy land, you know? Any Disney plusers out there? I love a good Disney movie, but we can kind of live in fantasy land. And, and I don't know about you, but I believe that there are some things that can change and I don't want to say all this in the beginning to discourage you. Actually, my aim today, and our aim as Liberty Church and as pastors, is to encourage you. But, but right, who here believes that things can change in your life? Come on, amen. How many of you believe that they should change? Well, now we're getting in, uh, uh, it's, it's getting dicey, because I want them to change. Now, how fast do you want them to change? Uh, now, immediately, right? But I love that we have this tendency as humanity to say, we can change. And, and things can change around me. Yes, things are going to happen to us that are out of our control. But we can change. And so I say this because without a dose of reality or a real dose of truth, we'll end up living in disappointment. And we'll just dream big and we'll hope big, but we may never actually step toward those changes and see God really show up. And so we'll end up living in pursuit and racing after things that we give ourselves to and we'll wind up with empty hands. Now, I don't know about you, but if you hold your hands out like this, I don't want to end up with empty hands like again. And sometimes it's again, again, again. I want us to begin to see, man, there's some real change that's happening in my life. And, and today we're going to start this series, Living Backwards. I don't know when you read that what you read, but I, I want this series uh, for you to catch this, that it's about how we should live in light of God's truth. God's truth. God's reality. <laughs> God's word. And it's going to feel like by comparison, when you start to make changes in your life and implement things that God tells you to do through his word, and you hold that up to your life, it's going to show you areas that you need to change. And by comparing your life to sometimes those around you, even those in your home that are not always on your diet plan or spiritual reading plan, hello, you're going to feel like sometimes you're living backwards. You're going to feel like you're living different than everyone. At the same time, 
let's ask this question. How would your life look different if we started with one certain thing about your future? One certain thing about your future and you worked backwards from there so that you could know where to begin. There aren't many things that you can control, but the only thing we know for certain about our future is a truth and a reality that we all know too well, but we don't want to ever think about it. We avoid it at all costs, and that's precisely why we don't sometimes truly live, truly have life and life abundant according to what scripture says we can have. And so we'll live in denial from this one truth. And I haven't shared that one reality with you yet. But because I'd rather choose blissful ignorance. And never pause and ponder and grapple with the deeper things of life. And think about the inevitable future. It reminds me of a funny scene. Let's lighten the mood because some of y'all are getting real serious. Y'all are like, what is this one thing? It's going to get a little serious today, but let's, let's it reminds me of a, a, a scene from a movie. Whoever here remembers seeing the movie Frozen, Disney, okay? Frozen. My, if you have young kids, you've probably seen it. You've definitely, like with young girls, you probably, you've got the, the songs memorized. But there's this one character, his name is Olaf. And he's dreaming about his future. He begins to sing a song in the middle of the movie as he's dreaming about his future as a snowman in summer. And he starts singing, a drink in my hand, my snow up against the burning sand. It's probably getting gorgeously tan in summer. Oh, my moment to shine and sing like Olaf. I don't even know the real actor's name, but he's got a pretty good voice. Winter's a good time to stay in. This is the part. This is the punchline. Winter, winter's a good time to stay in and cuddle. Come on. But put me in summer and I'll be a, a happy snowman. No, you're going to be a... And so, right, the other character in the movie that are watching him sing, Kristoff, this mighty mountain man who's got the dose of reality. He's the, the, the buzzkill. He's like... I'm going to tell princess, I'm going to tell him he's going to turn into a, and she's about to say, and she's like, don't you dare let him live in his dream land, in his fantasy land, right? And I think that's kind of where we are. We know the inevitable punchline. He's going to turn into a puddle. He's swimming around in a pool in the ocean going, what does snow turn into when it gets in warm water? And he's like, just happy. But here's the reality. The truth is, is we all like to live in a little bit of ignorance. And, and that does not help us. So somebody say the word truth. Truth will set you free. We need truth. And so we're going to begin this series by looking into the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and the theme of this series is we're going to allow one of the most interesting books of the Bible. And it's found near the middle of the Bible in the Old Testament. We're going to allow it to give us new perspective on our future and on our life and allow it to change us with the truth of God's word. And Ecclesiastes, I got to tell you, is a hopeful book, but it's a book of reality. It's a book of realism and it's a book, book of truth. And the writer is so adamant about getting his point across and about us embracing the reality that life can be very bittersweet. And he confronts some of our delusions and he pulls the rug out from under us. But it's so hopeful. It, it, this book might, though, come across as a little bit cynical. It, it, it's as if he's the character of Christoph. You know, uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes is Solomon, and it's as if he is the character of Christoph giving everyone a dose of reality and, and bursting, uh, bursting one's bubble. And so today we're going to burst a couple bubbles, if that's okay, with God's truth and kind of wake us up out of our sleep and slumber and out of our just daydream. Is that okay? So let's start at this one thing we know for certain about our future and work backwards from there. And Ecclesiastes jumps into this huge reality that if we're going to begin living backwards in, according to God's truth, we have to start with a proper view of of our death is the secret to learning how to truly live. Did you know that it says in scripture that it's appointed once unto man for a man to die once and then the judgment and that's that's another scripture but the reality is is we are all facing death, true? Reality check. Pop. And so he he jumps into this conversation. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 
the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, said this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. And then he says it emphatically, everything is meaningless. How many of you have ever been there in life? What does this mean? Oh God, meaningless. And then he goes on to say, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. He goes on in the next few verses. They're not on the screen, but I encourage you to go read it. The sun rises, the sun sets. It hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north. It goes around and around and around. If you've ever fin felt like you've been around and around and around the sun in the rat race of life, and it's just one more year, he's kind of pouring his heart out to say, what is going on? The place the streams come from, they return again. It's wearisome. I'm worried. I'm trying to hear, and I'm trying to see, and the eye never has enough of it. And so he goes on to say this verse, is there anything of which one can say, Look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Somebody say, wow. <laughs> Pastor Cliff, it's not very encouraging right now. Because he starts off with meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. That is not the word of the Bible. That's not, whose favorite verse is that? Right there. Come on, raise of hands. Anyone? Takers? You're not going to go print it on your Christian t-shirt.com website and make millions, are you? That's not going to encourage, coffee mug with Jesus? Meaningless, Jesus. Meaningless. It's not your favorite verse. It's not mine either. But as I grappled with this verse, it made me realize that he's giving incredible insight to life and truly living. The son of David, the one who cried out to God and said, God, at some point in his life, he said, God, I want to have wisdom from you, O oh God. Amen. And he became known as the most, the, the most wisest king and wisest man of all. And he's wealthy. He's prosperous. He's the son of David. He becomes a king. He helps build the temple of God. He also wrote Proverbs. You could go read one of those, every, one chapter a day every day of the month and be wiser for it. This guy, Solomon, and he, yet he starts off with meaningless. And it's an interesting word because this word, it means vapor. Vapor, it's so hard to translate. But some translations would say it means vanities. It would also mean a type of hollowness of life, if you'll indulge me for a moment. This is what he means by meaningless. My life, it has breath, it has meaning and purpose, but I haven't found it yet. And I'm running after all these things and, and I see all this stuff that God's, and it's been here long ago and God's given it, but my life feels like that. Have you ever felt like that where you just, just everywhere? Vapor. But it means deeper than vapor, it means hollowness. And if you really dig deeper, the vanity part means a heavy hollowness. How can something that God gave me to live and move become so heavy and hollow? Man, if you're not a Christian, this just might be one of the most hopeful books that you could read today because it's rooted in a harsh reality of life that it gives hope to those that would say, I'm an, I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. I, I'm Gnostic. I, I don't believe because of the heaviness and sorrow of life. How can a loving God write all those questions? And you start to go, what? And I'm heavy, but he's giving a dose of reality saying, this man Solomon experienced the pain and the bitter and the weeping and the bitter times of life and the sweet victory moments of life. And what he's saying there is far too often, real life is beyond our grasp. You can't grasp a vapor, you can try. You can try to pursue things and run the rat race of life and call it meaningful. But if you're not careful, it's a vapor and it vanishes. So he wakes us up out of this daydream by saying the repetition of life. 
In that verse 7, all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. He says the streams flow into the sea for what purpose? Because it's never full. And he's pondering and he's saying what has been done will be done again. And I liken it to kind of like that other movie of the 90s. I can't. Groundhog Day. <laughs> Get up. Do it again. Same cup of coffee. Meaningless. Thank you, Jim. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just, no, you get your life, you go after purpose, you go after God, all those things. But sometimes we can get in the rat race of it. And he's caught in the middle of it saying, there's nothing new under the sun. He's just saying time and life will move on. If you pick up in verse 11, remember he said, no one remembers former generations. And even those yet to come will not even be remembered by those who follow them. It's so true. In a hundred years from now, who here is really going to remember Taylor Swift? Swifties will. They'll try to pass the baton. Right, Bieber? I don't know, but... It proves the point because even like my wife, we're talking with our kids about an incredible band and bands of our day, and we were talking about some old rock and roll bands, and I'm like, guitarist Van Halen, whoo, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this old band and that old band, and then I was like, and you know the band U2? And my kids were sitting, and they're like, U2 who? And they're like, U2 what? U2 do what? And I was like, no, 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 it's U2. It, do you spell it Y O U T W? T W? What? I don't understand. And I'm like, because you've never heard the band. And they've been a band in our generation. And my own children know Olaf, but don't know you too. Bono, The Edge. Anyway, I'll keep moving on. And it proves this theory. So let's, you, you help me prove this theory. It's sobering. We will all be forgotten. How many of you know both names of your grandparents? On both sides of your family, raise your hand. Boom. Okay. Quite a few, more than half. How many of you know both great grandparents, first and last name, on both sides of the family? It's slimming. It went way down. How many of you know your great, great, great grandparents' names on both sides of the family some hundred years ago? And you, we've got one. I wish I had a gift card for you. You're amazing. <laughs> you get brown. You, you get the points today. That's awesome. But it proves this thing that we might not even know the names of people in our family just a few decades ago, just a few generations ago. It's sobering. Some of you are like, I came to church to not be depressed, Pastor Cliff. But, but yet we still strive to prove that we are running our life and running this race and we always try to pepper it and season it with like I am living a meaningful life and so we try to uh, filter it with meaning I'm striving for meaning and Solomon writes that the humanity that humanity does this in three particular ways Solomon tried grasping at them and we do as well and number one uh, let's let's have some fun a little bit more today we're gonna say the first one that that we try to grasp is I, intelligence, intelligence. He goes on to say uh, that he went after intelligence. He was a king's son. He had influence. He had the world's answers at his fingertips. He tried to gain insight and wisdom from the mysteries and secrets of the world systems. And he had education and money and all of it at his fingertips to go down that path. And he recognized that himself in that equation, he said, I, somebody say I, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And when I did, I discovered what a heavy burden the Lord has put on all of us. Like, follow me here. When we recognize that, that when we try to carry intelligence through the world system, we begin to carry a burden that we were never meant to carry. Some of us have this fear of missing out, FOMO. Fear of missing out, fear of not being smart, fear of not being intelligent or, or, you know, getting ahead. And so he's saying, I've seen all the stuff that the world has to offer and it's a chasing after the wind. 
interesting. This morning, I had a bag of these balloons, and I walked out of the front door, and the wind blew three of them out of the bag, and I was like, this is what Solomon meant, because I dropped my coffee, I put my coach leather backpack that I was gifted with a couple of Christmases ago on the wet ground so I could save this illustration. I can't fail the church today. I got to have a balloon. And I chased after the wind. It's so silly. My neighbors were like, hey, pastor. <laughs> Not going there again anyway. Uh, it's a phrase that Solomon would use repeatedly, how we strive to find the good life and to find answers. And yet, where was it again? Yet it's a chasing after the wind, and it's meaningless. And that's what he said. And then he went on to say, pleasure, pleasure. He would go after pleasure. I don't know if you can read that. You can read P, pleasure. Solomon would deprive himself of nothing that he wanted. He indulged in every manner of pleasure at his fingertips. Women, concubines, sex, power, control, pursuit of dreams. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. See, there was a period in his life where even Solomon was not truly living for God and for his word and for his ways, the way his dad taught him how to worship the Lord and serve the Lord well. And he said, I said to myself in Ecclesiastes 2, 1, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good, but that also proved to be hollow, meaningless, heavy. And there are two ways we can learn. And I love that the Solomon, he's kind of holding up his life and his sinful experiences as a roadmap to say, you can learn from your own mistakes if you want to, but the better way to do it is learn from the experience of others. And this word, mind you, there are so many authors throughout this Bible that, that, that teach us the ways of the Lord to live so that you don't have to make the mistakes that so many others have made before us, generation to generation. Can I get an amen? It's in there. It's wisdom. It's understanding. It's life. It was breathed by God, and he's saying, learn from me. Eleanor Roosevelt said it this way, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dose of reality. Thank you, Eleanor. Man. And then there was wealth. I hope we're preaching and kind of speaking to people's hearts today because we want to set the year right, 2024. Do we need to be going after intelligence the wrong way, uh, pr uh, pleasure, the wrong way, money, wealth, Solomon's wealth. He, he would make anyone live, living today look poor. He owned all of D.R. Horton. <laughs> he owned all of the land. I mean, this man, we collect baseball cards and stamps. He collects gold and temples and countries. <laughs> it's amazing. He's wealthy. The wealth note would be in the billions and trillions of dollars in today's wealth. In Ecclesiastes 2.11, he said, When I surveyed all that my hands had done and all that I had accomplished, what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Man, it makes me pause and think. And I know for time today, I want to fast forward to kind of the end of Ecclesiastes 12. Somebody say, oh, we don't have time to read all 11 chapters. You're going to get to lunch on time. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 12. I'm going to give you the spoiler alert. At the end of Frozen, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> who here, nobody wants to have a spoil alert in their movie. But in the word, I want to jump to Ecclesiastes 12 and see how, the, how Solomon wrapped up all of this conversation about life and living backwards. He said, yet, excuse me, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, now all has been heard. He's basically saying, if you'll go read this, if you'll go put it to the test, if you'll go study this, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. I'm going to pause and like let you read it for yourself. Fear God. 
This is the conclusion of all of life. Fear God. You're like, fear? Question mark? Fear God? Well, let, let me read the rest. Fear God and keep. Another word would be obey his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Solomon's con conclusion is that chasing and grasping and running after intelligence and pleasure and wealth and all of the things wrapped up in that was simply out of all these different variations and forms of the wrong kind of fear. How many of you know that going after intelligence is, I don't, I've had fear of making a 90 on a test. I was weird. I was a weird kid. I wanted to make straight A's and, and make a hundred. And, but I had the fear of looking what? Stupid. I still sometimes carry a fear of wanting to, to, to pass the test, make the grade. I, I want to appear smart. I don't want to look. Who here wants to look dumb? <laughs> so he's saying, though, that that can be a fear that drives you toward the wrong way of living. Uh, it can drive you toward evil. Then there's fear of failure, fear of not providing, fear of success, or fear of being unloved and chasing all of these sexual tries and, and, and situations and relationships just to see if we can grasp at the meaning of love and relationship in life. And so Solomon found the secret, y'all. And he says, I lived through all of it, and I lived not according to the Word of God for a while in my life. And if you want to truly live life, he, he, he got the prophet prophetic glimpse before Jesus walked the earth that life begins with the proper type of fear. He's the same author who wrote Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Other translations would say the beginning of all wisdom. And it flows from there. So somebody say like a question mark, fear? Fear? Why would he encourage us to fear? And when we say fear, this word is yaira. Yaira. It's not on the screen. Yaira. It does not mean a hateful fear that is condemning. A hateful fear that you have to be afraid. Afraid and live out in fear and in trepidation of God. It doesn't mean that God's hateful or judgmental in nature, although he is the judge. It means, Yaira means I will have a loving reverence and a loving respect. A, 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 I will never lose, it's like a double word that says I will never lose the awe and wonder of our King. I'll never lose the awe and wonder of an almighty God who created summer, who created the sun and the moon and stars, and he created you and I. And this word fear is saying, if you can learn to yaira, if you can learn to receive the fear of the Lord and have a rightful respect and reverence and honor for God and his word, then you'll begin to live life backwards. And you'll start from the beginning of all wisdom and all truth and all meaning and purpose of life so that life no longer has to be looking like hollow heaviness. Ask yourself, how did life become so hollow yet so heavy at the same time? And he's saying, if you will fear God and Yaira, you can begin to turn life upside down, right side up, and live backwards and begin to take a posture of Yaira that says, God, I kneel my life before you and I see you as God, creator of my life. And only you can bring purpose to my life. Yaira. So what I'm saying is, is what Solomon is saying. There's a better way to live. Living backwards means you start living by fearing the Lord first. Fear the Lord first. It means that God is now in the right place of your life. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
It means his word and his truth has the right priority in my life. And it's all the wisdom that I need comes from the most high God and comes from his word. It actually goes on in other passages of scripture to say, and when I fear the Lord, he begins to give me understanding. Uh, my, my concern for Christ followers today is we, we along the way try to add church to our life or add a book to our life or add a verse to our life, but we really don't build our life on the fear of God, uh, the understanding that he made me, he fashioned me. And the same God who breathed his word Amen. is the same God who breathed life into me. Amen. And although my life is a vapor and a dash between two dates, and he knows when that day is coming, he wants so much meaning and so much life and so much purpose to be put within those two dashes. It doesn't mean, you won't, it doesn't mean you'll have life without bittersweet your life could be like, it's kind of funny and not, it could be like a piece of dark chocolate. <laughs> it's just sometimes bittersweet. But he puts the right pleasure, the right sweetness, the right life in your life. His spirit is the source of life. He's the meaning of life. His hands guide my life. He upholds my life. He gave me my breath and gives me purpose in my life. And what I've learned is in about 15 years of full-time ministry now, I've been with people at the end of their life. How many of you have ever, just sobering moment, you've, you've been at the bedside with people in your life? It's very sobering. And what I've learned is at the end of life, when people are approaching, no one says, hey, bring me my diplomas. Bring me all of my awards and my plaques and my certificates and lay them at my bedside. No one says, hey, go get the deeds to my house and my property. Hey, I want to go, go, go empty the savings count and Stack it up like Scrooge on the lunch table beside me and let me count it. No one says that. No one says, go get my smart keypad for my BMW so I can speak into it with one more breath and say, BMW, start. <laughs> and it, it br bring it up to the window so I can get and wash it really well one more time so I can, if you could just bring me a bottle of new scent and spray it on the little tree so I can... Really get one more breath of that before. No, no, no. That's insanity for me to talk like that. But yet so many of us pursue a heaviness and a hollowness. The things that very much God gave us at our fingertips to enjoy. Family, house, a car, friendships, church, relationship, the ability to produce wealth. But if we're not careful, we will not seek God first and then we end up carrying all of it and it's too much to carry without God and what God is saying today and what, what Solomon is saying through his word is why we start here in 2024. This question right here, make it personal. Do you fear God? Do you, Yaira, God? Have you put God and his word in his rightful place? Do you seek him in Jesus' name. Could you bow your heads with me and close your eyes right where you are? I pray that today challenges you to turn fear upside down and inside out. And no longer hold it and carry that. But you would set it down at the feet of Jesus and recognize that there is a loving Heavenly Father who loves you who gave you life and breath. And when you begin to value that life the way God values it, you'll begin to live in a new life. I want to encourage those today who you've said, man, Pastor Cliff, I mean, you don't know all that I've experienced. 
I've even talked with someone recently this week who's been challenged with crisis of faith and they're saying, I'm an evil person and I've done things that I've never spoken about. And if I begin to talk about it, it just proves that how much I've hurt others and how can God love me? How can God forgive me? I've been hateful toward others. I've hurt others. I've accomplished a lot, but I don't have a lot. And God is saying in this moment, stop chasing the wind. Stop carrying fear and begin to bow your life and fear me first. Have a right respect of me. Give me the heaviness, the sorrow, the pain, and I'll give you life and life abundantly. Today, God's speaking to you that. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to, in a sense, surrender your life to God, to kneel before Almighty God. Perhaps that's raising your hands right now and allow God's love to drive out fear. I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. And that's how you begin to yira. That's how you begin to live for God is saying that I will receive Jesus' life. You see, Jesus walked a sinless, blameless life. He died and was buried and was raised to life so that he could say, death, where is your sting? He dealt with all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your chasing the wind, and he says, give it to me. I've nailed it to the cross and I give you new life. I give you mercy. I give you my spirit. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, raise your hand right where you are and say, I am bowing my life to Jesus as my Savior. Raise your hand right now in his presence. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, anyone else? Awesome. Let's pray this prayer. Let's pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for being raised to life and giving me new life. Jesus, I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. I receive your spirit right now. And let's pray this church all together. Jesus, help me fear you appropriately. Help me have a right reverence and awe and respect for you, God, for your word. Help me live backwards. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Come on, can we give God praise for those two hands that were raised today?